Okay, I think we can start. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, we're going to start the webinar, uh, but the people will probably uh, still be joining during the webinar, uh, but we are going to start anyway. Uh, if you have joined this webinar as a participant, uh, your camera will be uh, switched off as well as your microphone. Uh, but you're very welcome uh, to um, put any questions you have uh, of this uh, webinar in the chat box. Uh, our technical moderator, Leo, uh, will keep an eye on these uh, questions and we will make sure that uh, during the Q&A session that we will have um, at the end of, of this webinar, we will discuss these questions. Um, I would like to welcome you to our fourth webinar uh, the, of the webinar series, Life as an Activist. Uh, we are focusing on realities and challenges that democracy activists um, are facing all over the world. Uh, we want to show you the varieties of democr uh, democratic activism and the varieties of challenges they face. Uh, we do believe that even though political situations are different in every region, we still can learn from each other. Um, and we at Democracy International um, declared November as a month of activism. So because of that, uh, every Wednesday uh, of November, we host a webinar. You can join us during those webinars uh, on Zoom or uh, YouTube. Uh, and before starting, I would like to thank uh, Engagement Global and uh, the Federal Ministry of Economic uh, Cooperation and Development of Germany uh, for sponsoring this webinar. Uh, this week, we will be focusing on uh, democratization, uh, self-defense, self disinformation, and activist journalism, more specific in uh, Taiwan and the East Asian region. And I would like to introduce our two guests of today, Brian Hu and uh, Bruno Kaufman. Brian is uh, one of the founding editors of New Bloom, and an online magazine covering activism and youth politics in Taiwan, and the Asian uh, Pacific, uh, Asia Pacific, that was founded after the Sunflower Movement, as well as non -re resident fellow uh, at the University of Nottingham, Taiwan Studies Hub. Uh, our second guest of today is Bruno. Um, Bruno is the global democracy correspondent at the Swiss uh, Broadcasting Company. He has covered democratic developments in Taiwan since 2003 and uh, has visited, visited the country more than 50. Uh, 25 times. He serves uh, currently as the International Visiting Fellow at Taiwan Democracy Foundation in Taipei. Bruno is a political scientist uh, born and raised in Switzerland uh, with permanent uh, residence in uh, Sweden. He's a member of the uh, Executive Board at Democracy International and uh, co-chaired the Global Forum on the Direct Democracy between 2008 and uh, 2023. His publications on direct democracy and uh, representative democracy have been published more than 30, uh, in more than 30 languages worldwide. Um, now I'm going uh, to give the word uh, to the first speaker. Um, I think that was uh, Bruno or uh, Brian. Yeah, Bruno. So yes, uh, thank you already for joining us. And yes, uh, Bruno, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Katrain. I think, in fact, that uh, Brian uh, should start, but uh, I'm not sure about that. But uh, I can start if you want. Yeah. What did we say? E okay. Either works for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> yes. So, Brian, maybe uh, you should you should start. Okay. Sounds great. Um, so I have a PowerPoint. Let me load that. Um, why is it not working? Um, just give me a minute. Okay, so can you see this? Uh, is it working? Sure. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk a bit about my work as an activist, but also uh, some of the contemporary challenges about Taiwan uh, as relevant, I think, to the current elections, because we do live at an interesting time in which there is suddenly a great deal of international focus on Taiwan. Uh, for example, in past years and past decades, it's been harder to raise awareness of Taiwan. It's often been overshadowed by its larger neighbor of China, of course, which it also has geopolitical threats from. And so that led to challenges. For example, uh, 10 years ago, there was not this attention on Taiwanese politics. 
But now then we see in publications such as the New York Times, they'll have a discussion of Taiwan as an austere rock in a typhoon-laden sea with 24 million people uh, talking about how semiconductors are the kind of building block of the digital economy and how this is a, a contributing factor to tensions regarding Taiwan, China, and the U.S., and so then you also have, for example, this uh, now infamous, at least in Taiwan, economist cover, terming Taiwan to be the most dangerous place on earth. And this is interesting because it's a way that international media has framed Taiwan. And perhaps it's not inaccurate views, but uh, it can be sensationalist. And Taiwanese people sometimes have reacted strongly. I think particularly because of the uh, economists, for example, this titling of Taiwan, many people in Taiwan felt, well, we're, we don't feel dangerous. So it di differs greatly from our subjective perception of how we go about life. And Taiwanese perspectives were then neglected in this discussion of Taiwan. And so um, then you have to talk about trade tensions, uh, you have all those folks on Taiwan after U.S. Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan, and uh, uh, then these kind of very alarmist uh, op-eds in New York Times, for example, Thomas Friedman, why Pelosi's visit to Taiwan is utterly reckless. And then we have these geopolitical threats to it uh, regarding uh, the PLA, um, uh, for example, air incursions or naval activity. And uh, I think what's particularly interesting in terms of my work as a kind of journalist and activist is then how to platform Taiwanese voices uh, in a discourse that is increasingly alarmist and does not actually center Taiwanese voices or their views or assessment of uh, their own democracy or our own democracy. And uh, I think this is actually kind of dangerous in a way, because as you talk more about war, it seems to raise the odds of this happening. And we're ahead of an election that is coming up uh, that will take place in January of next year. And one of the dangers then is regarding disinformation. Uh, for example, that you can have the PLA uh, uh, these various military activities taking place around Taiwan, but perhaps what occurs is not communicated well by the government, or people panic, and people panic that could lead to issues. Uh, it's easier for China to take Taiwan if people are afraid and demoralized, and then uh, they don't fight back. And so it's within China's interest to create disinformation and create panic. Uh, there's a lot of discourse at the moment, what's discussed uh, as U.S. skeptic discourse, uh, trying to raise questions about the reliability of the U.S. as an ally, uh, particularly after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, because uh, it, all this discourse circulates that was provoked by, for example, Ukraine getting too close to NATO and then uh, Russia taking action and justifying Russia's actions that way. And the framing then is that, well, perhaps this could happen to Taiwan if Taiwan becomes too close to the U.S. And the U.S., for example, wants to fill Taiwan with landmines, it'll become like Cambodia, or that it'll turn Taiwan into a munition stockpile uh, for the sake of warfare and that the U.S. is warmongering. And so this is a kind of very interesting dynamic here that uh, now we are dealing with. And uh, I think particularly in terms of my own work then is trying to... Uh, react quickly to disinformation as it spreads, because particularly uh, the work I do focuses on writing and reporting on Taiwan in the English language as the person that founded an independent media outlet. And so um, this is something that's very relevant too, to our discussions of democracy uh, in terms of direct democracy or uh, elective democracy in terms of elected representatives, uh, because of the fact that perhaps with information uh, warfare, this democracy could be manipulated and that public opinion will go in a way as China prefers it. And so then I'll talk a bit about my own work then. Uh, for example, uh, I'm best known as the person that helped found New Bloom magazine, which was founded in 2014 after the Sun Department. And so that time, uh, during that time, I was a student activist and I participated in the movement that some of them were just out of college. And that movement was against a trade deal that the then ruling party, the KMT, hoped to sign with China. And the concerns regarding that were that this would allow for Chinese investment in the service sector industry. There would be self-censorship. Uh, there'd be a political uh, impact on Taiwan society that had already been seen in preceding years because of the fact that uh, there was cases in which media outlets were bought up by pro-China uh, business conglomerates. And then they... Um... Sorry, I think this is popping up. Uh, and then they would try to censor the kind of news that was disfavorable to China, that painted China in a negative light. So you would not have recording, for example, of what was going on in Xinjiang. Uh, and you would have this overemphasis on the missteps of any other government that was not from the KMT, which is the historically pro-China party in Taiwan. And uh, this kind of reads as apotheosis uh, is a problem that continues, actually, even with the news reports by the Financial Times that there are outlets in Taiwan that directly take orders from the Taiwan Affairs Office, who have a say in the editorial direction of newspapers, such as the China Times, 
or that they directly accept funding from the Chinese government of sponsored content, except from a state that seeks to undermine Taiwanese democracy. And uh, so that continues. It reads this apotheosis in the last election cycle in which one candidate as favored by the head of the uh, Wantuan Group, one of the major foodstuff corporations in Taiwan that also owns a number of media outlets, was covering 70% of content on television stations about one candidate. And of course, it's very difficult to uh, come up with that much content. So was, every little action was being reported on as in a in a very favorable light uh, to the point that people and reporters were desperately scrounging around for favorable stories and making every minor event into seeming like a minor miracle. And so maybe that also gets a bit of the nature of democracy. But in short, this movement was the... Um, a youth-led movement. It led to the entrance of many young people into politics, uh, whether that was in terms of becoming kind of elected officials running for office. Uh, one of the most famous is Freddie Lim, for example, the heavy metal uh, musician who is also an activist that later became a Taiwanese legislature. And then you have a generation of young people that ended up, it, for example, in uh, NGOs and uh, or even the media. And so uh, there was a wave of civic organizations that were created after the movement, uh, including mine, which now publishes on Taiwanese media, uh, on Taiwanese news and social issues on a daily basis. And we also run a physical space in Taipei where we hold events, uh, talks and discussions about public ideas and social issues facing Taiwan. Because I think particularly what is necessary for a democracy, uh, one that does have elections, is accurate information. Otherwise, people are not practicing democracy on the basis of accurate views of the world. And that can lead to dangers, dangerous choices, uh, candidates that are outright lying or uh, playing up or exaggerating various accomplishments or tarring their enemies with uh, falsehoods, actually. And so that that is an issue. And that's a issue in Taiwan. Uh, particularly, we have this issue from China regarding for example, the, uh, the invasion threat, but also these attempts to undermine Taiwanese democracy from within. But there's also the very commercialist aspect to uh, Taiwanese media in which you have clickbait. The media does need to make money to survive. And so then you have a lot of uh, just uh, um, uh, kind of sensationalist news to drive up clicks for ads. And that too can be dangerous, particularly when you're dealing with topics that need to be reported with sensitivity, such as uh, military activity, in which if there are inaccurate perceptions of the world that circulate and the military acts on wrong perceptions or exaggerated perceptions or an incident is blown out of proportion, then you could have more, in fact. And so that can be quite dangerous. Uh, and I think uh, particularly then with elections, it is similar. I mean, just uh, you have a lot of... Uh, uh, candidates in Taiwan that uh, express questionable views of China, uh, for example, uh, whitewashing it or saying that, well, we need to imitate the model of China, that it is an economy that is doing well and is very effective, that this democracy thing is, in fact, quite messy and certainly is. There are massive street protests, such as the Sunfire Movement, uh, that some members of society would view as socially disruptive. And yet uh, that maybe is necessary for uh, the function of an economy. And uh, I guess we can discuss it more, but it's interesting to think about the ways in which, for example, then democracy can be undermined from within. And so in recent years, we do have events such as Hong Kong, the protests that broke out in 2019. And that was something that I traveled there to report on and to witness personally. Uh, it was something that involved also a generation of young people who were deeply politicized and willing to take uh, dramatic actions uh, to fight for the freedoms that they once had. Because with China taking control of Hong Kong from British uh, after British colonialism in 1997, then you see the steady erosion of democratic freedoms there. And in truth, Hong Kong, the democratic freedoms were only introduced after uh, around the time of the handover because of the fact that Britain did not want to be perceived as abandoning Hong Kong to China, particularly uh, after uh, the Tiananmen Square massacre. And so these were introduced more or less at the tail end of British colonialism, but democracy does take root and people uh, are willing to stand and fight for it. And so then in Taiwan, this was something that also became a kind of influence on the 2020 elections. It swung the elections in the favor of the DPP, the historically pro-independence uh, party that originated from the democracy movement, because of the fact that it was perceived as a sign of what could happen to Taiwan if it fell to Chinese control. And this is another way in which information or news could be quite important and influence events in Taiwan. In this case, this is new externally, events from outside of Taiwan. And one saw similarly, for example, with the uh, aftermath of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, in which uh, there was similar concerns. Because these concerns regarding a Chinese invasion or the undermining of Taiwanese democracy, that's not new, but it became a powerful external uh, way of repackaging these longstanding concerns. And so then you have massive solidarity rallies in Taiwan taking place uh, at some points in in uh, uh, during the election cycle on a daily basis. And so, um, for example, protests for Hong Kong uh, calling for aid to Hong Kong refugees and so forth, um, and also just to take stronger action against efforts by China to undermine Taiwan 
uh, to take a firm line there. And that swung the DPP, the election in the DPP's favor, as some perceive it as such. And Ukraine has proved similar, which you also do have Saudi rallies taking place on, in some points, uh, particularly at the height of tensions or uh, news focus on this on a daily basis. And so then you do have a similar kind of sense of solidarity. And um, so it is quite interesting there. And that also goes to point how there are these uh, concerns uh, and news then can become a powerful influence on times democracy. But then this is a way in which, for example, they pushed uh, people into voting for the political party they thought could preserve Taiwan's existing democratic freedoms. In this case, that was the DPP, the Democratic uh, Progressive Party. And uh, what's interesting, too, is that there are other points in which, for example, because Taiwan does have these uh, institutions for direct democracy by way of national referendum, then that leads to public opinion going in the other direction, a fear mongering, for example, about uh, gay people. And that led to the voting down of a referendum in 2018 for regarding gay marriage uh, and referendums. Then it's quite interesting because that was actually something that was pushed for historically by more uh, pro-democracy groups in Taiwan or civil society groups in Taiwan when the KMT held office. Uh, whether in terms of the authoritarian times, because it once ruled over Taiwan as an authoritarian party for what was once the world's longest martial law period, and continues to exist after democratization, but took power again from 2008 to 2016. Uh, during that time, people were pushing for lowering these benchmarks in order to try to get around the KMT holding executive power and being seen as ramming through bills such as led to the Sunfire Movement, because the trade deal that the KMT was trying to push for Despite that, uh, it would have very large impacts potentially on Taiwan. It was uh, passed in under 30 seconds without legislative review, and that's part of what led to such a massive backlash. And so in recent years, uh, with the election of Tsai Ing-wen after the Sun Farm went, uh, on the back of support from young people, they have this kind of emphasis on more progressive social policy. Uh, for example, apologizing to indigenous groups on behalf of the ROC state. And uh, Tsai herself, the president, is in fact part indigenous. Uh, but then also legalizing gay marriage. And that was something that also I mentioned, there was pushback. And uh, when there was the referendum that was held on gay marriage, uh, that led to uh, questions about whether uh, human rights, fundamental human rights, should in fact be put to the national referendum. But uh, particularly then at that point in time, there was this kind of fear mongering from conservatives about what would happen if gay marriage was happened. For example, in Taiwan, um, after you know, you die and pass away, your name is on a memorial tablet where your ashes also are. And claiming then that if you have gay marriage, that's not going to happen anymore because you're not going to have the family, the traditional family institution and the structure. And that's an absurd uh, fear, but uh, there's this kind of fear mongering or saying that's against the traditional Chinese or Taiwanese culture. And many of those that were involved in um, many of the, the the conservative groups that rallied against gay marriage were Christian groups. Um, and so that's a sign of, uh, I think, how democracy in Taiwan can be under contention. But I think, again, it's uh, important to think about how the biggest threats to democracy in Taiwan are often from without. And in the past, uh, when it came to reporting on Taiwan that uh, I often felt did not reflect on these perspectives, trying to get uh, kind of perspectives out there into the international world, I thought it was important. And there were a number of writers that tried to do that. Uh, for example, pointing out that there were that people in Taiwan were not melting down during the time of global tensions when there was so much discussion around it regarding uh, Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan, uh, that people were still going about their everyday lives, that people were not desperately seeking air shelters uh, because these military drills that occur in Taiwan and are this kind of external impact on this democracy, they occur at a distance from Taiwan. It's not exactly a new threat. Uh, even you could say the, the China threat has probably played a role in consolidating democracy in Taiwan because of this desire to differentiate oneself from China, uh, in part just to uh, perceptions of the international world and how that affects the, uh, the, the willingness of other countries to defend Taiwan. Uh, but also then just that Taiwan and China, uh, China across the strait, offers a powerful negative example of an authoritarian government, of what life could potentially be like if you do uh, uh, fall to Chinese control. And we see that with, for example, protests that have taken place more recently, such as the A4 demonstrations in China, which involved uh, demonstrations against the government maintaining COVID-0 indefinitely, uh, but hoping to use this as a means of social control because of the fact that uh, it's a way to keep people not talking to each other and expand government surveillance and reach over society. And uh, what's particularly interesting is uh, working this kind of space between uh, the international and domestic news, uh, writing on Taiwan from a Taiwanese perspective in English, there's often this kind of boilerplate uh, description of Taiwan as a renegade province and so forth. And now we see that kind of changing, and that's maybe through the efforts of uh, of Taiwanese people trying to get their voices out there, but also international views on Taiwan are changing. Um, so you have articles that are from sympathetic people calling for an end to calling Taiwan a renegade province, for example, and how not to write about it. Because... Um, with the issues that face Taiwan from disinformation and misinformation, sometimes it is attempting to rally these kind of social fears. Like I mentioned regarding gay marriage, uh, this kind of disinformation about 
how that can impact just the traditional commemoration of the deceased. Uh, but then when it comes to uh, disformation from China, again, the attempt is to really play up this view of Taiwan as having been part of China since time immemorial, and that Taiwan's current de facto independence is the aberration rather than that the fact that is, is the PRC has never controlled Taiwan throughout its 70-year existence. And uh, oftentimes, then, the uh, framing of Taiwan can be dangerous, framing more pro-democracy, historically pro-democracy forces, which may be more historically pro-independence, but have since moved away from such positions uh, because of the potential to provoke China, turning them a troublemaker. And uh, maybe that doesn't outright count as disformation, but narrative uh, is a very key part of it. And China's attempts to influence Taiwan don't always take place through disinformation, which is often imagined as spreading through social media, but take place through traditional media, through weasel words, through framing, and through narrative itself. And that's often the kind of work I think I am engaged in as an activist and a journalist, is trying to clarify those perceptions or have more nuanced and detailed uh, and localized uh, writing and uh, information on Taiwan. And so information is interesting to think about. I mean, there's much more discussion now of, for example, uh, scenarios for warfare. And uh, these two books are interesting because they're uh, kind of more popular, uh, and you see more news coverage of military affairs as well, uh, popular descriptions of invasion scenarios from China. What happens if there's an invasion? And this also can involve disinformation because the uh, narrative China propagates is not often very accurate. Uh, for example, there's only two times a year that the weather conditions are right for China to invade. It's only certain beaches that are large enough for uh, China to mount a landing force. And so um, that's another kind of way in which, for example, I think news plays an important role. And uh, in terms of just allowing for more accurate perceptions about these dangers, uh, and I think a more realistic assessment of these dangers maybe lessens the the hyperbolic rhetoric that might actually make conflict more uh, possible. And so that's part of what I guess I deal with as a, a journalist. But uh, it's interesting to see what extent, for example, uh, you will have a disformation circulate. Um, this was the wrong picture. But to the Pelosi view uh, visit, uh, there was, uh, for example, a photo of a, a PLA soldier on a Navy vessel with binoculars showing a Taiwanese Navy vessel and beyond it, the coast of Taiwan. And that was disformation. That was a photoshopped image because of the fact that vessels never became so close to Taiwan. But it's an attempt to make the Taiwanese military seem weak, to make Taiwan seem as though it's, everything is a pushover in the PLA the People's Liberation Army could take Taiwan at any given time. And unfortunately, despite the fact that that was a photoshopped image, it became the most recognizable picture of the uh, military exercise that China launched last year after Pelosi's visit that would take place closer to Taiwan than during the uh, third Taiwan Straits crisis in the 1990s. Uh, and so that's a way in which the media maybe does not do its job. And so now we have all the discussion of Taiwan being potentially invaded by 2027. But again, accuracy is important. For example, 2027 is the date that experts believe uh, China could have the capacity to invade Taiwan, not when they will actually do it. But then this ends up this way, uh, presented this way in the news, and it becomes increasingly hyperbolic. And I think that perception is dangerous. And so that's part of what I'm working with. Uh, and it's interesting to think about the various strategies then that China has sought to target Taiwan in terms of influencing it, whether that is uh, disinformation outright on the military or on candidates to try to defame them. Uh, and it takes different forms, uh, targeting different demographics. For example, young people with TikTok videos, such doing videos or memes. Uh, with older people, it's more like text and image oftentimes. And uh, the, the mechanisms by which disinformation operations are being carried out become increasingly complex and something to deal with. And uh, oftentimes it is actually dealing with uh, events that happen in domestic politics regarding allegations about politicians. Or, uh, for example, there's a bizarre conspiracy theory that Tsai Ing-wen, the president, uh, does not in fact have a PhD and that her dissertation is fake. And this is a um, Taiwanese equivalent of birtherism, for example, in the U.S., alleging that President Obama was born, in fact, outside of the U.S. and does not qualify to become the president. Uh, and so you do have this kind of circulating, uh, but then also regarding military threats as well. And that's kind of another venue in which you do see disformation. And it's something that is both uh, originating from outside, from China targeting Taiwan, but also domestically from people that do side with Taiwan, uh, sorry, with side with China, and through, uh, as propagated more easily than ever through social media, but also traditional media, because oftentimes fact checking leaves something to be desired. And so I'll leave it there um, in case anyone wants to reach out or follow my work on the this is a way to do so. But uh, I'll be looking forward to discussing and uh, hearing Bruno's presentation. Okay, thank you, Brian. Um, thank you for this interesting presentation. Uh, I would like to remind our uh, participants that you, uh, if you have a question, you can ask it in the chat and that we, that we will discuss it later in the Q&A session. And now I would like to give the word to Bruno.
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, Brian, for this very impressive uh, overview. I think this, uh, this uh, role of being a democracy uh, supporter on one side and a democracy reporter on the other side uh, becomes uh, more and more important in our times because it's so much about the, the, the information, flow of information, misinformation, uh, quality news, uh, fake news, which are driving a lot of, of political decision making. And uh, so it's 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 very uh, much for me a, a pleasure to be part of this conversation. And I mean, as you showed uh, in the very beginning, this picture about the uh, uh, about um, about be, uh, from the economist title that Taiwan should be the most dangerous place on the on earth. I obviously uh, uh, not uh, for this reason have been very much uh, attached to uh, what's going on in Taiwan. I was invited 20 years ago for the first time when the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy started its operation. And one of the first big issues uh, at that time was how to implement the constitutional provisions for direct democracy into legislation. And in fact, uh, for me, uh, Taiwan is one of the most interesting places on earth and increasingly also, and of course, not only for me, one of the most democratic places on earth. So it's a very much a, a lighthouse for democracy uh, in Asia. And um, uh, we had uh, many opportunities together with our organizations involved in this cooperation, like 2019, the Global Forum on Modern Direct Democracy took place in Taiwan uh, in three uh, steps. In fact, first we had a, a, a the Taiwan democracy train driving from the north to the south with people from Taiwan, with international participants. And we had the Forum 2019 in Taichung, uh, which had a, a, a broad conversation about uh, the experience of Taiwan, but also how democracy develops across Asia and East Asia. And now, as uh, Katrina has said in the beginning, I'm very happy to be back. In fact, I will be back very soon uh, for uh, several months to uh, be on one side part of the uh, Taiwan Foundation for Democracy, where I try to get an even better overview about how uh, democracy develops in Taiwan and how influences and aspects from across the world uh, can be compared to, but also to cover, of course, and to follow this very important electoral campaign and, and process which is taking place now with the election, the first most important election in next year, where the whole world will see a very intense election year. On 13th of January, Taiwan will be the first country to vote. Afterwards, we will see many other elections across Asia, like in Indonesia, like in Bangladesh, India, also the European Union and US and Mexico and South Africa will have major elections. So 2024 will be a major year for democracy, for elections, for people power. So Taiwan will make here a very important um, difference. Now, looking into the global state of democracy, uh, uh, which uh, uh, sees a report published every year by International IDEA together with partners based on, 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 on data from researchers from around the world, we can see that Asia and Eastern Asia has seen in recent years developments very much similar to many other places around the world where like 10 years ago, there was something like a, a, a big hope that everything will become much better, that all the indicators went up. But in the last 10 years, we have seen a roller coaster ride of democracy in many countries. On this map, you can see just how democracy has evolved in different countries, the more red the more negative, the more uh, 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 blue, the more positive. But in fact, you can see also that certain countries like Taiwan, like Indonesia, like Aus Australia, and even, even uh, uh, New Zealand uh, have been uh, more stable, even Mongolia. But we see, of course, that in many countries across um, the, the region, especially the influence from China hasn't been very positive. And we have seen in countries like uh, Myanmar, of course, and in Afghanistan now military forces or fascist forces taking over, while in countries like India, but also in the Philippines until the last election, there has been a lot of, of autocratic trends 
to democracy, which uh, every time when it starts with a more autocratic movement, the freedom of uh, opinion, the freedom of assembly, the freedom of press is under attack. And on the other side, we see many different aspects which are important to uh, uh, the, the democracy development, uh, which can include formal institutions like for instance, uh, uh, legislators, courts, but also political parties on one side, and on the other side, independent institutions and bodies like electoral management bodies, the media, and also uh, human rights groups, and then, of course, also informal organizations. So what we can see is, and in the case of uh, Taiwan, it's very interesting that all these different kinds of institutions are getting stronger, more or less. Of course, there have been up and downs, as Brian already has said, uh, remembering the 2014 big uh, uh, um, movement uh, to uh, to contract what the, go the government and the legislature at that time tried to do. But also, when it comes to the rule of law, there are a lot of, of battles going on in Taiwan, but also in other places. And in fact, of course, the uh, formal institutions of electoral and direct democracy are very much on the debate and are still, you can say, uh, in many ways to be developed further. And again, uh, as, as, as Brian has said, and as I also feel as a journalist, the responsibility of independent, of, uh, of, of non-biased media are more important than ever. So going uh, over the whole world, it's very interesting to see that when it comes, for instance, to participatory rights, uh, Taiwan is doing very, very well. It's the, the most developed country in Asia. It's one the only Asian country in the top 10 uh, across the world. And we also see uh, this is the, the ranking for participation from the Global State of Democracy report, where Taiwan is now on, on the fourth place. And this not only includes direct democracy, but also other ways of participation in society. Um, on a more uh, uh, global overview from the varieties of democracy, we can see that Taiwan uh, has improved. It's on, on, on the 30th spot. But again, here you can see that participation is probably the most uh, uh, the most uh, uh, impressive part, having Taiwan on the third spot after Uruguay and, and Switzerland. And uh, I think when we look into these tools of, of, of formal participation, of formal direct democracy, this is really the translation of the idea of active citizenship, of citizens who can stand up for their own term determination, but also being part of a society. Being active citizens means being an activist citizen, but also being able to make your voice heard. And this is something which in autocratic countries or in paternalistic countries are much less, uh, let's say, uh, um, resilient towards uh, the backsliding of democracy. And here we have seen in Taiwan, but also other places like Indonesia, like recently in, in Thailand, and now also in the Philippines and Malaysia again, that people are ready to stand up for their rights. They are ready to take responsibility and to make their voices heard. The Direct Democracy Navigator, which is an overview about all tools of direct democracy around the world, also underlines the importance of this, especially in the case of Taiwan, but also other countries. As Brian already has said, uh, 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 direct democracy is enshrined in the constitution of Taiwan since many, many years, but only since 2003, there have been implementation laws, which allows a certain amount of the people, currently 1.5% of the people, to gather signatures, which is about 280,000 signatures, to propose a law to be put to a referendum or to propose a new legislation through initiatives. And it has been interesting to see that these tools have been uh, um, differently used. Uh, also, as uh, described before, I mean, the uh, parties, the political parties have been very instrumental when it comes to direct democracy. They have been in favor when they are in opposition, and they have been much less in favor when they were in uh, uh, government. Uh, Uniquely, you can say after the change of government in 2016 in Taiwan, the government and the DPP enforced the Democratic Party. They still believed into making this 
more available, more easy to be used. And already two years later, at the occasion of the local election, when there were 10 nationwide referendums, they got afraid of it again, because, of course, normally direct democracy is not the main uh, a tool of a government party or a majority party. It's always a tool of a minority or, a, or an opposition party. So this creates this kind of, let's say, uh, confrontations, which in this case led again to change the legislation about direct democracy and to make it much harder to pass uh, referendums and initiatives. And I think still there is a lot of of issues to be addressed, to be learned. For instance, the quora, which requires, for instance, that you need 25% of the electorate to, to approve a, 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 a new law, to, to pass a vote, which creates over the time now a list of, of many referendums which haven't passed. So we had, until now, had 20 such referendums uh, uh, triggered by the citizens and just one triggered by the parliament in a constitutional uh, a law about lowering the voting age, which was voted just a few um, uh, a few months ago uh, in uh, December 2021. But uh, the uh, Central uh, Election Commission, which I, today I must say I was surprised to see on the front page of the Central Election Commission of Taiwan, still a picture with me and the chairman of the commission uh, from a meeting earlier this year, uh, they have been uh, in a way very reluctant to still to 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 propose these improvements because they're very much also under a, a government influence. For instance, the legislation which was adopted in 2018 also required the provision of an online signature gathering system, which until now haven't been implemented. Of course, there are fears of misuse, of manipulation, of external uh, 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 impacts, but still it's in the law and it should be implemented at some point, as well as other provisions for direct democracy. So I feel at this point, still uh, in many places, uh, also in Taiwan and of course across the world, the very idea of democracy as a, a system where not only you know the rule of law is 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 ensured, where the basic freedoms are ensured, where uh, minorities are uh, are protected, but also where people as such have a right to make their voice heard and their votes are not just counted on election day but heard every day. Still, democracy very much is in many ways in a birdcage and. The tool and the task of the democracy supporters and also reporters is about allowing democracy to fly, democracy to blossom and to make these ideas and these principles of democracy working in Taiwan, in Asia and across the world. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much for this uh, presentation, you know. Uh, before we go to the uh, questions from the audience, uh, I also have a couple of questions for you. Uh, my first question is, uh, are there certain, uh, certain uh, innovative approaches you have seen in the journalism community to strengthen uh, democratization? And how can, this, uh, how can these serve as an inspiration for other societies uh, striving for democ uh, democratic participation and dealing with a security threat from outside? So yeah, I think for Brian. Yeah. Oh yeah, I figured it was for me. It was on media. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, there have been a number of innovations. I think particularly um, after the Sun Farmer, there's a lot of rethinking of uh, media in terms of just being dissatisfied with what happened during the movement. Uh, that there was actually not coverage of uh, by newspapers of things that they felt was disfavorable to their political views or their political stances. And that the news was too tabloidy and shallow and so zoomed in on very surface level or sensationalist views of the movement and was not accurately reporting on what was happening on the ground. And so as a result, then you had uh, a lot of kind of investigative outlets appear after the movement. Uh, and you had attempts then to call for more oversight. So at events such as the uh, passing of the attempted passing of the bill could not happen again in which it could take place because there are not people watching. And so that led to a number of initiatives to, for example, stream everything that was going on in the legislature, produce videos, sort of like CCTV in the um, US, just of, of what is going on in Congress. 
or uh, these more reporting uh, specifically on the legislature and what's going on there with the different committees. And like I mentioned, there's a desire to communicate with more than one age group. And so creating different means of communicating such messages. And for young people, that's often the forms of uh, kind of slideshows or memes or uh, things that are humorous. Uh, and then you have these various activities going out into communities to teach them about media literacy and and uh, how to spot disinformation in things places like temples or parks where maybe you don't have as much young people, but it maybe is older people that are consuming disinformation through uh, messaging apps like Line and so forth. And then you have the emergence of various uh, fact checking bots uh, online and other platforms to automatically spot disinformation and then will produce a link to what is more accurate information. This is often depending on crowdsourcing. Uh, and now I think there are new challenges with the rise of AI and uh, all this kind of generative content. Uh, but there have already been work, I think, from civil society in terms of trying to develop tools to deal with that ongoing for some time, even before the uh, kind of explosion of chat GPT and so forth. And so I think there will probably be new technological means. Uh, it's also an interesting thing about the digital experiments in democracy uh, for V Taiwan, for example. It's a platform to kind of discuss social issues that are controversial in society uh, through uh, this kind of um, you know online platform with ranked kind of polling. And so that's another kind of digital tool that's been developed to try to uh, formulate a better policy. And it's not exactly media, but still uh, politics in that sense. Yeah. May I add, I mean, from, from my point of view, is that uh, what, is, what is interesting for me also um, um, observing and following um, democratic reporting uh, in Taiwan, but also in other Asian countries, is that there is relatively little um, coverage, uh, uh, I mean, prominent coverage of local local affairs. I mean, uh, uh, city democracy, uh, uh, local government uh, democracy is, is, is covered, but not in a in a way that it's really inspiring so much the national level. And that's sometimes a little bit surprising because there are so many interesting local governments and cities around in the region. I mean, in, in countries like Indonesia, the diversity on, on local democracy is so big, but also in countries like the Philippines or, or Japan. And very often on the national level, you, you see very little about this. And this creates, of course, a, a, a very focal point on national politics. And this is mirrored uh, in a way in, a, in, in the practice, for instance, of participatory and direct democracy as well. Because, I mean, in Taiwan, the, the, the rules for direct democracy on the, on the local level are, are the same basically as on the national level, but there are very few local votes. I mean, and this is, this is, this is really uh, a contrast to the experience, for instance, from, from, from Germany or from the United States, where direct democracy is mostly exercised on the local and the subnational level, not so much on the national level. And this, this is an interesting development. And I, I, I would be interested to hear from you, Brian, how you see this, how, how, how if, if local uh, uh, co communities and local governments aren't a good, like, uh, the breeding ground for for democracy also on the national level maybe in the region yeah absolutely i think that's a really interesting question uh because of the fact that for example uh until the past until fairly recently uh, many more younger progressive politicians or uh, more pro-democracy let's say viewed as very difficult to compete at the much local level uh that legislature is a much easier position to win than let's say city councilor or county councilor or uh even below that that you know for example the lowest level which is bureau chiefs because of the fact that uh, corruption is thought to be more deeply rooted at the local level uh, the kmt the former authoritarian party of course had deeper clientelist networks in kind of local areas and so it's very hard to weed out corruption and make things more transparent and i think um Taiwan, I mean, I often contra the argument that it is a small country because looking at the population, it's something like 50th largest in the world, 20th largest economy, population is comparable to that of Australia, just geographically it is quite small. But because of the fact that it's geographically small, it is small. And so if you do want media for, let's say, your social issue, you probably will go to Taipei, even if you're in the south or in central Taiwan or somewhere else. And so then uh, it's very easy for local conversations to become national conversations, yet there's still much more pay attention paid to the national conversation than there necessarily is at the local level. I still think it is possible to have kind of more discussion of that, um, just because of the fact that, you know, elections are, or you have these ads are ubiquitous everywhere and of the local candidates, and you can really get to know them that way. But oftentimes it can still be kind of superficial because you maybe don't know their policy. Um, it's actually a very interesting thing, I think, about uh, communication democracy, too, is that in the wave of 
civic activism after the Sun Parliament, younger candidates, they did not want to use traditional politics, uh, the kind of rubbing shoulders that one had in the past, going to weddings and funerals and social events, but not discussing policy and not ha- and having just a kind of one line tagline that says nothing like, you know, fair and honest, but doesn't say how you're going to be fair and honest. And so then you have attempts to have policy and QR codes where people scan it. Uh, but then that turned out not to be successful because that's not what people are used to. And when you engage in such style politics, then you do have voters viewing it as, well, you think you're above us, more highly educated, and you don't want to actually meet us. And and so there was actually a a need eventually to kind of engage in more of this traditional politics, even if I think younger progressive force were very against it. And that's that, again, gets heavier, I think, as you get to the local level, uh, in which, for example, city councillors are and county councillors are expected to provide services for voters, such as uh, free lawyer services or hosting and organizing fun activities uh, for your constituents. And so that that is another, I think, challenge there. And that that issue gets worse, I think, at you get to the local level. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's a very interesting observation. And I, I, I obviously uh, uh, understand what you say. And it's, 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 it's really interesting to say that it's harder to democratize and to exercise democracy on the local level than on a national level. But um, uh, maybe also there are there are changes on the way. I mean, I understand that the, the election system on the local level has been changed. There are the bigger bigger communities now. There are a lot of these kind of smallest uh, uh, village levels have lost of its importance. So obviously, corruption is harder to to entertain on these levels as well. And this is maybe an opening to a more a more let's say a, a vivid, a vibrant uh, local democracy development. Because at the same time, I also understand it's a very interesting ground where you, as a citizen, really see what's going on. I mean, when it comes to environmental issues, when it comes to economic issues, I mean, there is a lot of things going on uh, at that level. But um, thank you so much for 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 sharing. Maybe Katrin has another question, or people will have other questions yet. Yeah. Yeah, so I uh, would like to remind everybody that you can still um, ask your questions in the chat. Uh, I have another question. Uh, In November uh, 2022, a proposed constitutional uh, amendment that would have lowered the age uh, requirements to vote in elections and uh, run for office to 18 years old failed in a referendum. So my question is, do you think people uh, still believe in uh, referendums in Taiwan uh, or in other forms of the direct democracy? And, or does this mean that people are less interested or that parties are seeing this as a less good tool? Yeah, it is actually a very interesting too, because the uh, as Bruno mentioned, the DPP changed the referendum act when it was clear that it could be used against it, increasing the benchmarks needed to hold a referendum again. Uh, but then lowering the voting age to 18, uh, the voting age is currently 20. And that makes Taiwan among the highest, uh, it's among the highest in the world in terms of age. Uh, most countries in the world have a voting age at 18. Uh, but then there is this public backlash sometimes against the prospect of lowering the voting age, saying that, well, you can't have these younger people that don't know anything about the world voting, which doesn't make a huge amount of sense to me because between 18 and 20, what is the difference? Uh, and so that is actually um, part of the challenge. And I think that particularly is a strategic. Um, it's actually uh, the DPP would benefit more from lowering the voting age as the uh, historically pro-independence party that's more pro-Taiwan identity, whereas the KMT would not benefit because of the fact that its constituents are much older. Uh, Two years ago, it had less than 9,000 members under 40. The claimed recruitment is up by 40% in the two years since then. Uh, And so the KMT uh, and the DPP, ostensibly they agree on this, but then in reality, it's the DPP pushing for it and not the KMT. You can't really say that you want to disenfranchise young people, so the KMT will not emphasize this uh, this uh, stance, but they don't really campaign for it. And as for the DPP, because there was the split of the uh, timing for when you uh, hold referendum and hold an election, it doesn't have to be on the same day now. That means lowering uh, lower benchmarks. Uh, I'm sorry, sorry, that means it makes it harder for the referendum to meet, meet the benchmarks to pass. But then what also occurred is that the DPP threw this out there during a non-presidential election year. It was actually, it was actually going to be held same time, but uh, you're not going to have as much turnout as compared to a presidential election year. They're trying to use it as a way to get young people to come out for an election that they thought would maybe not turn out so well, I think, in their favor. But uh, in retrospect, that uh, also shows that they did not take that very seriously. And so there was not a lot of push on their part either. The DPP did criticize the KMD for not leaning into the issue and not actually uh, trying to 
take action really to uh, make sure that young people do get this right to vote. But then the DPP too is, is sort of a back burner issue, actually. Their campaigning around it was not particularly strong. They're much more focused on winning local races at the time. Uh, so I don't know, think it points to necessarily anything about the referendum system itself, but uh, maybe how the major parties can really uh, influence what is on the uh, public agenda in that sense. And that, of, that particularly uh, applies to referendums because that is a case or a system in which you can take an issue and directly put it to the national conversation. Yet the political parties still maintain a very kind of strong influence in that process. And I think that is what it illustrates. Mm. Yeah, I, I just want to add to that, uh, that um, I, 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 um, I fully share your, your analysis on that, that it's not in itself a problem of having the initiative and the referendum rights, which I feel most people in Taiwan today uh, support even the the bigger parties as such, but that uh, the, it's still very much an instrumental view on these tools from the political parties. Is it beneficial to me or to our opponent? And the experience of the last twenty years have very much been this that it has been used by political parties, uh, the major political parties, and in that way it gets very polarized. And the problem is, of course, I, I would support. I mean the the decoupling of 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 uh, referendums and elections because i think it's as the 2018 experience showed it was like an overkill of issues an overkill of i mean in a system where you have to vote everybody in person on the same day the queues and the and the election commission was totally overwhelmed by this experience and it wasn't a very good experience for most people in participating on the other side I, I, I also would say that the, the way that quoras are used by having this kind of supermajority rules, uh, of course, invites those who are not just against or in favor of a vote to have a third option, which means non-participation. And by non-participation, you can influence the outcome, which means you can make a, a measure failing just by not participating. And this, again, creates a, a non, a, a, a non, not a good playing field for the election. It would be like when you would have an election for a president and those who are not participating in a vote uh, would also have in a way, a representation, or their vote would also be counted for or against a certain candidate, or it would invalidate a presidential election. These are very problematic uh, ideas how to how to balance this vote. So I am clearly in, in favor to to make the system much more stable, much more uh, clear cut. Also, when it comes to the binding character of a vote, because until now we have seen that there is a risk that even if a uh, vote is failing or approved, the legislator still can basically do what, what the legislator want to do. So it's not a, a legally uh, a, a full-fledged system of balancing direct and representative democracy. And I, 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 I must say that in a, in, a, in, a, in a bigger picture in Asia, of course, Taiwan has come maybe the longest way, but it's still a way to go to make it really useful and to make it in a tool for strengthening democracy uh, in Taiwan in a longer term. Okay, thank you. Uh, then I have one more question. Um, how do you see Taiwan's role in promoting democratic values uh, and stability in the East Asian region? And what challenges and opportunities does this role bring uh, both for Taiwan or the neighbor uh, neighboring countries? Yeah. <clears throat> so on that front, I think particularly uh, Taiwan often likes to position itself as a beacon of democracy uh, for soft power purposes. Um, but at the same time, I do think there is some truth to that. Taiwan can show the uh, potential of democracy uh, with a large authoritarian neighbor, uh, China, then China will claim that, well, look how messy a democracy is. But then in Taiwan, I think it can show that it can get things done. And so, for example, uh, COVID-19, that Taiwan could go for more than a year without lockdowns because of this active culture of civic participation in which people were willing to comply with uh, regulations and trust the government, it shows actually uh, faith in a democratic system. And that was, uh, it's uh, it to be counterposed actually with China in which COVID-0 
was a very authoritarian measure. And then it was used as a means of social control beyond uh, uh, the kind of the pandemic. And so I think there is this uh, example that then Taiwan can offer because you often have discussion in the region of the so-called East Asian model of development or uh, so-called um, Asian democracy values. And that usually means just uh, uh, something that is ostensibly democracy, but then there's still an authoritarian side to it. And I think Taiwan could provide a counterexample. Um, as Runa brought up, there has been the uh, significant democratic backsliding in the region uh, with coups, for example, in Thailand and Myanmar and these military regimes that uh, in countries I've seen many coups and there have been movements that have arisen, uh, whether in Thailand or Myanmar or Hong Kong uh, and beyond or in Philippines in which you have the, the uh, son of a former dictator being elected. And uh, those are examples of the risks in the region and Taiwan has managed to avoid that. I mean, it's true that there are some dangers. The self-proclaimed grandson of Chiang Kai-shek is now the Taipei mayor, for example, uh, but uh, uh, it has not gone to that extent of, you know, calling for an overturning of the democratic system. I mean, he is still a politician that runs within the democratic system. And I think then that that can show that this uh, kind of claim about uh, uh, whatever Asian solved democracy or Asian values is actually can be quite false and that democracy is, in fact, universal. And Taiwan can become an example of that. I absolutely agree that Taiwan is really an example how to... Um... How to uh, move from a from an autocratic system to a democratic system, where also the former autocrats or the the ones who are, were part of this autocratic system can understand the benefits of democracy and become in a way supportive of it. But at the same time, of course, due to the very special geopolitical and diplomatic situation, there is a, in my view, a big ambivalence. How? Taiwan can contribute to, to make democracy stronger in the region and around the world. And there is very much a tension between a very traditional, formal way of diplomacy on one side, where every, for instance, and I see the good reasons, very, every so-called ally, even if it's the, the worst dictatorship who supports Taiwan, is still seen as the biggest friend, while uh, others, maybe more democratic uh, partners who are who are not uh, on this on this. Uh, line are are, are 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 much less seen as as partners and the the, the 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 solution for that is of course much more investment into public diplomacy people to people diplomacy uh, 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 cooperation between media in taiwan and other places the taiwan foundation for democracy where i'm a, a, a visiting fellow just now is of course one expression of this idea of making democracy a strong infrastructure. And uh, but at the same time, of course, this organization is also as a mirror of the political situation, very much in a in a not always the most, let's say, expressive way or the most uh, um the most uh, accommodating way for, for democracy activists. It's very much an institution of the government and it gives grants, it gives supports, but it's it's not so easy to, to make the organization as useful as it could be if the focus would be more on public diplomacy and let's say more on a on a on a on a, on a, on a little bit less formal way and i think that's a challenge uh, you have very much in taiwan that you have the most let's say modern progressive forces at the same time extremely traditionalistic uh, formal forces uh, in a way living under this idea of how to make Taiwan a democratic place. And that's a challenge, not unique to Taiwan, but it's very expressed and very, very, very manifest in Taiwan today. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in. I totally agree with that. Um, one of the things about Taiwan is that despite often touting and framing itself as a democracy, then it is reluctant to side with pro-democracy forces openly in in uh, in the region because the fact is Taiwan is marginalized, it's internationally excluded, it's not acknowledged as country by the majority of the world's uh, nations, and so then the priority is on maintaining ties with the governments and not. Uh, civil society. And there is this rhetoric where in civil society, and there are organizations such as the TFD that do provide grants periodically to regional organizations and so forth. But then even there's a reluctance to help activists that really need help. Uh, so as Taiwan's lack of asylum laws, for example, is a very strong example where they don't want to have a formal procedure for uh, asylum seekers because they're afraid of the risks that come from accepting a lot of asylum seekers and potentially angering a government. And then there's this idealization of various governments as Taiwan's friends and allies. I mean, particularly the kind of turn in the U.S. under Donald Trump towards the kind of um, uh, populism, but then also very visible examples. For example, Modi's India is a great example. I mean, just literally he's abetting religious violence and then he is praised as a friend of democracy. And even as 
authoritarian uh, rule by him is really eroding away at uh, India's democratic institutions as the world's largest democracy, uh, that is that is quite dangerous. And Taiwan is unfortunately just chosen to take the easy path of not calling us out while framing itself as a democracy. Okay, thank you. Uh, I don't think there are any questions yet in the chat box. That might be just because it was a, already a very clear uh, presentation. Um, I would like to take uh, a minute uh, for a little uh, poll because we receive funding for this uh, series of webinars uh, and we need some information from the audience. Uh, so if you can uh, quickly fill in the poll that should disappear right now on your screen, uh, that will be very helpful to us. And um, in a minute we will continue. And uh, if you would like to ask uh, a question, uh, it's possible in the chat. So you can write it down in the chat. And then Leo will um, ask the question at large to the guest speakers. OK. Um, Oh, there is a question. Leo, you can. Uh... Yeah, so one question from Joe Matthews. Um, what was the impact of recall in Kaohsiung? Kaohsiung? I'm not sure I'm reading correctly, but uh, have you got the question? <laughs> Yeah, I can answer that. Um, uh, yeah, the recall of Kaohsiung, um, you know, for example, what's interesting is that as there's this kind of lowering of the benchmarks to hold a referendum, there's also a lowering of the benchmarks to hold recalls. And that's led a phenomenon in which there are revenge recalls. And so then the other camp will leverage on this and try to recall politicians, whether progressive or whoever, just if they're the other camp. And so that's another way in which this has been weaponized, I think, by political parties. But in the case of Han Goyer, the uh, KMT presidential candidate, that was the mayor of Kaohsiung, he was recalled by extremely large margins, just like extremely unprecedentedly large turnout in Kaohsiung for that, uh, represented to what extent there was dissatisfaction with his mayorship in that he uh, went off and campaigned for president and just kind of left the city and there are many days in which uh, there are a lot of public incidents in which he just kind of was like taking days off because he had too much to drink the day before or uh, various things like that. And a lot of behavior that was very unbecoming, I think, of uh, politicians. And so it was very uh, large uh, in that sense. And uh, there's such backlash. And uh, the paradox, though, is that the mayor uh, himself, Han Goyer, who was actually perceived as a kind of populist style candidate that was dangerous maybe to democracy if he did to become elected, uh, because this very kind of uh, populist rhetoric and uh, not very clear policy was all over the place and is... Uh, brand was really built on personality rather than any clear stance or ideology. Uh, but then he is still a figure in, in politics because he does have this kind of wave of mass support. And he was recently named to uh, the party list because uh, there's proportional voting as part of the voting in Taiwan, where you vote on the party and uh, there's proportional representation in the legislature. He's in the number one position on the uh, KMT's party list, which means that he's still considered a very viable politician. And that puts him in a position to be the Speaker of the House um, or the legislature. Um, and so that uh, uh, actually is uh, something that does reflect that the, despite this recall, he's still around as a politician and still viable in that sense. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I see there's another question. Um, do you want to read that? One other question. Is Taiwan seeing you, the use of deliberative tools like citizens' assemblies to address uh, climate or other issues? Um, I'll open on this first, yeah. And uh, the thing is not as much. Uh, that has been a tendency in other parts of the world. Uh, what's actually interesting is that there were some attempts with that at the end of the Sun Farm. There was a motion to kind of have these open street discussions that are kind of deliberative assemblies that uh, 
maybe similar to a lot of the kind of assemblies that emerged around Occupy Wall Street a few years prior. I think there was kind of global trends in the early 2010s, particularly around occupation style movements that have this kind of restoration of people's democracy, uh, direct democracy through this to get around what's perceived as blockages in the legislature or the power, uh, un un unblocked power of uh, the executive branch uh, through this kind of open uh, kind of evoking of the spirit of the people. But uh, beyond that, there has not been as much. Um, I mean, there are uh, there, there is actually, uh, for example, regarding various local protests, like uh, that lead to, let's say, not my backyard protests. You know, regarding infrastructure, often, uh, or de demolition of homes, eviction. Uh, the government is then often accused of holding uh, public hearings just to be performative and seem as though they are taking people's viewpoints into account, when in reality, it's just kind of um, for the sake of performance. But I think that uh, there is, um, even if it's not on a massive scale, there is this very, uh, they have a need to do that. They feel that they really need to have this kind of sign of validity. So that actually does some create some wiggle room for local communities when they have grievances that need to be expressed to the government. Uh, and so that also, I think uh, it still does exist in that level, though I think it, it also does lead to many issues. I, I I would support this um, this view. I mean, what I see is that uh, as, as in Taiwan, the uh, democracy and politics are very much... Um, uh, uh, I mean, very vibrant and very much expressed. And there is, in a way, the, the question how much electoral politics, political parties on one side, and the forms of participation through direct democracy are covering the 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 the, 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 the readiness to participate. And at the same time, to create new tools, you know, uh, especially through digital democracy. Again, like we discussed before a little bit, there is a, a certain a broad spectrum of very formal uh, ways of doing politics on one side, and on the other side, a willingness to experiment. But I also see, as, as Brian has said, uh, maybe a, a little bit less than in other countries where, for instance, direct democracy is not at all uh, experienced and, and uh, available to people, um, not the same necessity of, 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 you know, you can gather signatures, you can bring an issue to the vote. All this, uh, uh, when you don't have it, you have to go to to this kind of more citizen assembly style uh, formats. I mean, we see that very powerfully, for instance, in Germany, where the, the move for a, a national initiative referendum process hasn't reached really the success the movements behind wanted. So many of those now are going more to this kind of citizen assembly tool, which um, creates a lot of opportunities, but also, of course, a lot of risks that you are just in a way in a consultative room where you are very welcome to express yourself, but where power is still very much limited to a very few people. I want to respond to that real quickly, because uh, it's interesting to the referendum system now that is, it was low, when it was lowered, particularly. Uh, can make a local issue into a national issue very quickly. For example, regarding uh, the the uh, way to treat the um, the uh, LNG liquidified natural gas terminals to be built off the coast of Tauron, which have threatened the coral reefs there. Local environments have been painting around the issues for ages, but then suddenly uh, when the KMT threw their weight behind it, again, pointing the role political parties can play, it became a national issue. But then suddenly a very local issue was a national level issue. And so that also has a kind of interesting dynamic. Um, it can have different effects, I think, for good or for worse. Okay, now to next question. One question from John. Um, what can we do to improve the democracy worldwide and human rights? Um, I also wonder that. Um, it's a really good question. I, I don't know. Um, I think it uh, does require a support, though, from organizations and, and so forth. Authoritarians really like to point to pro-democracy activists and claim that, well, these are just Western ideas and you know, you're backed by the CIA and whatever. Uh, to try to undermine the legitimacy of institutions. But I think particularly people to feel ties across borders, uh, though they will point their fingers and say it's conspiracy. I mean, I think that actually is where uh, pro-democracy actors can draw their legitimacy from this kind of support from various places. And so I think international links are quite important. Yes, I mean, uh, it's, 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 of course, always funny to hear that human rights should be a Western conspiracy. I mean, in a way, when you go into the, the value debates, what we whatever people you meet around the world from hong kong to tuvalu and from from chile to to greenland i mean uh, human rights and the freedom of individuals to self determination and to be 
part of their community is really universal and it's covered i mean in the universal declaration of human rights which have been signed by basically all countries around the world and which now celebrates 75th anniversary uh, uh, this year on december 10 and i think it's really important that we we don't let this narrative about it's not important to have basic freedoms it's not important to to protect human rights uh, taking over because it's not in the interest of us it's not in the interest of the, of most people it's maybe in the interest of a few who are trying to overcome these kind of limitations uh, uh, and their opposition to autocratic forces but what we need to do is clearly that we 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 are conscious about that that we we are working on on free and fair information channels but also that we are cooperating uh, around the world that public diplomacy becomes the main diplomacy instead of just government to government diplomacy so we have a lot to to develop in that and we have many you know also successes in the past, for instance, the introduction of a citizen initiative right on the transnational level in Europe, but also currently the move to establish world citizen initiative, which again creates an incentive to people around the world to bring their heads together. That doesn't mean that all the initiatives under these systems are uh, politically in my mind or in my way. I mean, it, it is open to all different kinds, conservative and progressives. But what we need to do is to work to have a dialogue together and not to see another opinion as a confrontation to me, but an invitation for a conversation. Um, moving on to the next question from Joe again. Um, there was a recent Yao news story saying that Taiwan's much touted digital democracy advances had been reversed and failed. Is that true? Um, that's I actually don't know that article in question, so I'm not too sure on that specifically. But I think um, what I would say is that uh, I actually never think Taiwan was really a digital democracy. It's something the government likes to talk about a lot to tout Taiwan as technological. The world would learn from Taiwan as a form of soft power. Uh, and, you know, for example, uh, let's say someone like Audrey Tang, the digital minister, and the digital ministry was uh, upgraded to actually, I mean, it was fully made into a ministry. Uh, Audrey was promoted from a minister without portfolio to actually a minister of a ministry. But then uh, oftentimes it is putting a kind of veneer, I think, on bureaucratic processes that already existed or legal processes that already existed. Uh, Audrey Tang's own role is actually an interesting example. For example, she is the first trans minister of a government in Taiwan, makes history. But then where is the government actually on trans rights? Uh, currently, it's, I mean, it's still in the process of being pushed back, but it requires sterilization to change your gender on legal IDs. And that's not something we've discussed. And even just having a transgender minister with sidelines that discussion. And so I think there's always a way to the government has always tried to frame itself as very advanced, but then it's a kind of branding. And uh, so it hasn't really gotten to that process yet. But I actually do think that there's a lot which is to be praised about so-called digital democracy in Taiwan, but it doesn't come from the government. Uh, oftentimes, the government is recruiting people from civil society and from the kind of uh, civic hacker community to join and and kind of brand itself this way. And it can be performative. I mean, with all these young people that entered government after the Sun Farment, part of the criticism is that they're just providing a kind of a, a younger veneer for older politicians that are still pulling the strings behind the scenes. I mean, that's certainly true. They control the parties that these younger politicians join. Uh, and... But I do think that there is a kind of civil society that is kind of pushing for these advances. And there is a kind of capacity for them to enter government that may lead to further change. And the government does engage, I think, with a uh, uh, civil society and the kind of civic hacker or um, kind of digital advocacy uh, in some extent. And I think that because there is such a vibrant community that adds to uh, the the government uh, and, and it's kind of the vitality of the scene. But I think such a if that is something that's democratic, that doesn't come from the government, that comes from civil society. And I think that's also to keep in mind. Um, I see no more question, but I, I would just have maybe one question um, more on the relation of Taiwan with China. So I found really interesting, um, like the perspective um, that you had in your presentation, because it's it's kind of against the common uh, perspective that um, there must there will be war and it's uh, inevitable. Um, and so my question is, uh, do you believe that China can be uh, convinced not to either invade Taiwan or uh, harm its democratic model? And what is the possible solution uh, you think has the most uh, chances of succeeding to achieve this? 
Yeah, that's a big question. Um, I also don't know that, but I think um, one approach is to wait it out, for example. And then as you wait it out long enough, China's historical claims start to lose validity. For example, 100 years after the Chinese Civil War or beyond, if it's become a long time, then then that's a, then China's claims are less valid or perceived as valid. Uh, I think it's worth thinking about that. Uh, China's claims over Taiwan are historical in nature. China is not I always emphasize this. For one, Taiwan only became a province of any Chinese empire for a total of seven years, and uh, no Chinese empire controlled the whole of it. So such claims are already somewhat spurious, uh, claiming as part of Taiwan, uh, China since time immemorial. But what I mean is that even the PRC under Mao at various points contemplated dropping these claims over Taiwan or did not seem interested in emphasizing it. And in fact, when they start to bring it up, actually, uh, very early on, Mao seemed to acknowledge that perhaps he viewed Taiwan as an independent country, similar to Korea or uh, other places. And so this itself was kind of, uh, it comes up, it's historical, it's not an ahistorical claim. And so uh, I think it's not to advantage of China to invade Taiwan. I mean, the, the number of deaths uh, would be north of 60,000, according to a CSIS, uh, American think tank report. And if you lose that many people in a, a costly war, that creates a major blow to your legitimacy. The economy is then in shambles. Uh, there'd be massive shocks worldwide, not even just from Taiwan's importance in the global semiconductor industry, just period, because of the size of the economy of Taiwan, much less its interlinked uh, nature with the Chinese economy. And so that's profoundly dangerous if you're hoping to maintain power. So that's one another way that perhaps just the CCP doesn't think it's worth it because they actually are taking enormous risk to themselves and their continued ability to rule China. Uh, I mean, people talk about China becoming democratic as another scenario for uh, non-invading, but I actually don't know if that's the case. I mean, for example, what if you just have a not exactly um, a very nationalist democracy that is more intent on the uh, uh, invading Taiwan? Maybe you do have elections, but I'm not sure I would actually consider that a democracy, but uh, just it, it is also possible that one could see a uh, not as authoritarian as the current version of China still wanting to invade Taiwan for nationalism. So I don't know either, but I think it does require a kind of dialing back the view that this is inevitable, uh, because I think the more you think about it as inevitable without realizing there are all these hurdles, then maybe there is a leader that is arrogant enough in China to decide to launch an invasion, and uh, despite the costs, without maybe thinking through the costs. And seeing the example of Ukraine and uh, Putin's decision making is actually a, a strong negative example. So I think that's worth keeping in mind. So I'm agreeing on that. I mean, it's a it would be would be a decision out of desperation. I mean, obviously, this kind of of uh, of of situation is so 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 strange to 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 behave like Beijing has done, uh, which is not reflecting what happened in Taiwan in the last twenty five years, and it has a lot to do with democracy. I mean, as long as two. Uh, both uh, countries were like autocrat autocracies behaving like they were the representative of China, the idea of China. Of course, there was another another uh, another uh, rational into into this conversation. And the the very strange thing from outside is to see that that the former, you know, the KMT and those who who who, who feel like they 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 still uh, believe into this idea of the Taiwan or the ROC, the Republic of China, is in a way the representative of of China. I mean, you still have in Taiwan today uh, a very uh, unique features in government. You have a minister from Mongolia and Tibet, for instance. So there's this strange idea of 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 this old uh, and not really reflecting into the new. And because of the pressure, of course, of China, it's not so easy to to uh, to uh, to uh, uh, emancipate from from this situation because it's a geopolitically one a very difficult one as well but the only way i think and that the most strong way of course is to make democracy in taiwan and the demo and taiwan's uh, society very resilient very strong in the values of civic community of democracy and that's the strongest point i think you, you can do uh, and uh, at the same time uh, being very conscious and that uh, shows the ukraine case of course that uh, you you have to be you have to be uh, protected by yourself and also by by allies and there again of course the benefit of the situ of the position of taiwan is very important being part of this chain of islands uh, surrounding you know the main land of, of of asia and i think that's that's an important point but without the strong and vivid and vibrant democracy i think it would be very hard to get this kind of support and this kind of 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 aid so again democracy plays a crucial role it's not the only uh, uh, life insurance but it's part of this life insurance uh, for for Taiwan and many other uh, uh, freedom uh, uh, striving people around the world. 
Hey, thank you so much. Um, to end this webinar, uh, I would like uh, to end it with a glimpse of hope. You are both uh, democracy believers. Uh, do you have uh, a positive a positive message to end this webinar? Um, I guess for me, it just don't take democracy for granted. I mean, it was something that took decades to achieve and and Taiwan a uh, struggle of you know many deaths in terms of fighting against authoritarianism. But there are many people that actually do take it for uh, granted and just don't think about that. And so they're willing to vote for pro-China forces or that they believe that China is more efficient. And so maybe we should do that. And I think that's uh, worrisome. So I'll end on that note, I think. Thank you. Yes, and I would say that, I mean, nowadays, today, democracy is under attack by many means, by many ways, by many ugly forces around the world. But we shouldn't uh, be, um, let's say, seduced to just put all our energy in fighting back those, but also to fight for democracy. Uh, it's, 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 it's a hard situation, but we cannot just go and say what our enemies are, what our opponents are, but we also have to see which are our allies, which are our friends, and especially believe in our own capacity to bring democracy forward every day. But we have to work for it. It's hard work, and it's a, wor a work which also gives a lot of, of, of happiness and joy, because when we can work together for the good, it also benefits everybody. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, also, big thanks to the audience of today for your uh, participation and the very interesting questions. Um, I would like uh, everybody to invite to our next webinar uh, next week. It's about uh, Kenya and Africa. And yeah, thanks again 